Hello everybody and welcome back to the Weird Tales podcast. As always, I thank you for being here and listening. And if you like the podcast, please leave a like and a review if you want to. Uh, Subscribe on Spotify and all the socials. If you want, send me a message on a topic you would like me to cover or if you just want to say hi. Anyway, I thank you for being here, so let's begin. Today we are going to the massive country of Russia, and we're going to talk about a man who became quite of a legend during his life and even more after his death. And the man we are talking about is Grigory Rasputin, aka the Mad Monk. And the first time I ever heard his name was actually in the 2004 movie Hellboy, where he um, plays uh, one of the bad guys, and he was very mysterious, and one of uh, the other characters in the movie describes how he dies, and it's very... piqued my interest, and he is played by um, Carl Roden, I think his name is, and the funny thing is, that dude is actually, I think he's German, but he always and very often plays like Eastern European Russian guys. But he is quite a good actor. Anyway, as always, when it comes to a person's life, especially a man like Rasputin, it's uh, a lot of rumors around. And I'm going to try to separate them from the truth. Uh, and. Uh, go from there and see if I can give an honest account of the man's life. Anyway, Grigory Rasputin, he was born into poverty on the 21st of January 1869 in a small town of Pokrovsky. And if I butcher the name of the town or any other Russian name during this episode, I am sorry in advance, I am not... A Russian speaker, so sorry in advance. The town is where he was born is located in the Tobolsk government. And if you would like to look at a map and try to figure out where this is, it's basically in the middle of Siberia, in the northern part. So without question, this was at least at the time, I mean, this is before the turn of becoming the 1900th century so it's absolutely in nowhere so his early life and family situation is not super clear because of a ton of lack of sources but what is known is that both his parents were farmers and some reports say that his father also worked as a as a ferryman transporting people and supplies over the local rivers. The life in Siberia during this time, or even today, uh, is um, quite hard, especially back in the 1860s. It was a life full of hardship and struggle, and this is illustrated by the fact that the couple of parents to Rasputin actually had seven other children who all died during infancy and early childhood. And before his um, rise to infamy and becoming famous with the royal family, not much is known about Rasputin's like young life, being a child and being a teenager and such. But after he became famous, there was a lot of stories that came out about that he was a troublemaker, accused of horse thievering and drinking and being disrespectful against local authorities and the church. But as I mentioned before, this is all rumors and nothing has ever been like set in stone. And also this is rumors coming out in the early 1900s because at that time he was picking up and becoming quite famous and I will get to that later. So, it's possible that a lot of these rumors were started or spread to hurt his character. And this is not a way of saying that 
he was a good dude. I'm gonna let you be the judge of that. But, you know, anyone get famous, suddenly there's all these stories about the person. But, anyhow, most likely, according to historians about the time, was that most likely Rasputin, like his parents, was not very well educated. And this was not unusual being that before uh, the mechanization and modernization of the Russian Empire, what would become the Soviet Union, there was a lot of illiteracy over the Siberian area. So this is not a surprise. But next thing we know for sure is that in 1886, he traveled to the town of Abalak, where he met a peasant girl named Praskovia Duprovina. And after a couple of months of courtship and hanging out, the couple got married and lived in Rasputin's hometown of Poperovsky. In total, the couple would have a total of seven children, but only three of them would survive until adulthood. And once again, that is proof of how hard life was at the time. Uh, and the thing about his wife is that everything I'm going to tell you later about what he did and that for what he became famous for, his wife remained loyal to him until her own death. So she was a, she was a keeper. And Rasputin was a religious man to begin with, but he was not really 100% religious. Uh, what I mean by that is that he was a man of, of religion, but he had his doubts around f- his faith. And this is not a, like a, a question of criticizing faith or religion at all, but it's um, when we are discussing him and what he did is um, it's open it opens up the door to ridicule religion and that's absolutely not what i'm trying to do but yeah i just want to put that out there and um, because in 1897 he undertook a pilgrimage to saint nicholas monastery at vericochur I'm sorry about that, but I, that I've tried to practice that name, but that's the, like the best version I can get. So, yeah. And he returned as a uh, transformed uh, man. People did not really recognize him af- after his pilgrimage. He, because he stayed a while at the monastery. And apparently here he learned to read and write. And when he returned, he had become a vegetarian He had sworn off alcohol and he was praying a lot more and singing more. So, on another word, if you might live in Siberia, you might need some new clothes. Well, take a look at our sponsor, Conjoint Clothing. They have really nice clothes and especially like their Simoheya hoodie. That's going to keep you warm if you live in Siberia. Might not be the most popular shirt in Russia. Whatever. There are uh, an independent clothing brand focusing on dark arts, dark humor, and true crime. And they ship worldwide. They're great. Check them out. Thank you, ConjoinClothing.com, for sponsoring us. Love you. So, Rasputin now has a new lease on life. And he starts preaching and gathering people in his own town. He also... During this time where he keeps living in his father's home, in his hometown, he goes away for weeks or even years and be, being a so-called stranik, which means uh, he is a holy wanderer or a pilgrim. And he does this to visit uh, different holy sites and preach to the people. And it didn't take long before he started gathering followers, having a bit of a reputation about him for being a holy man. Most of his followers came from his own hometown and his friends and relatives. And in his father's household, they made and own 
secret chapel where his group and his followers met. And this in its own turn was something that made rumors start spreading about him and especially his religious group. And these rumors mostly come from local priests and villages from around their hometown. And here some of the rumors was that he um, would have let the female members of his group wash him before the ceremonies. And you might not really think that's a big deal, but at this time that was seen as very controversial. And also one rumor was that him especially and the group took part in self-flagellation and had group orgies and such. So, however, no evidence of any of these rumors have ever been found or been proven. So, nobody really knows what took place in his uh, secret chapel. And in... uh, 1904 or 1905, it's not really 100% clear, but he traveled to the city of Kazan, where he quickly found success as a spiritual advisor and he helped people with their anxiety and spiritual questions. And this put him on the radar of a person called an Archimandrite, and that is an Orthodox. Uh, a Russian Orthodox term for an abbot who met Rasputin in this city uh, of Kazan and gave him actually for being uh, he, because he became quite you know, infatuated with him or like he impressed on him so he gave him a letter of recommendation to Biskop Sergei and that was the leader of the Alexander Nevsky Monastery in St. Petersburg. So this was big time now. And after this letter of recommendation was sent to the bishop, Rasputin later was invited and traveled to St. Peter- Petersburg, where now his life would forever change. And when he arrived to St. Petersburg, he, met, he meets with a second archmandrite called Theophan and he was so impressed by Rasputin that he invited him to stay with him in his personal apartment and gave Rasputin access to many of the saloons and rooms where the elite of the city and the aristocrats gathered to discuss questions of spirituality and an important thing about this time was that Rasputin came into this environment at, I would say, a perfect opportunity because the elites in Russian society at this time had a craving for something else than the Orthodox Church and a big interest had been formed for mysticism and the occult and the supernatural and this made Rasputin kind of perfect because he had a very special look to himself and he could preach very charming and such and also he was all a native Russian from the poorer parts of Russia and that made him quite exotic to the city's elite because we need to once again think about the social hierarchy at this time I mean, this is in the late 1800s, and class was everything. Like, if you were born at the top, you you were at the top. If you were a farmer, if you were at the bottom, you never co-mingled. So if someone from the bottom who has answers to life's big questions meets with the aristocrats, they're going to see him like this, like this special man. And if he's charming, I mean, sky's the limit. So this now becomes his life, where he travels back and forth between St. Petersburg and his hometown. And every time he now shows up to St. Petersburg, he was kind of building his legend among the elites of the city. And this led to, in the 1st of November 
in 1905, Rasputin was introduced to the Tsar Nicholas II and Empress Alexandra Fedorovna at the Peterhof Palace. And he impressed the couple so much that the Tsar actually mentions in his diary that he and Alexandra met an extraordinary man of God. And he then returned to his hometown and then later returned to St. Petersburg in 1906, where he presented the Tsar with an icon of St. Simeon of Verocouture and met their children actually on July 18th in 1906. And many meetings between the Tsar's family and Rasputin happened. And through these meetings and and discussion, the Tsar and his wife got convinced that Rasputin was a special man, that he possessed abilities and could help people. And one person in particular that he could help were their young son, Alexei. And Alexei was suffering from hemophilia. And uh, what that exactly is, is that a, uh, a person suffering from hemophilia is a person that if they get cut or something, it, it, it's easier for them to bleed and the ability to coagulate the blood is much less than in a normal person. So having this disease and being a young child, it was basically a death sentence. So if he hurt himself, he could die and such. So, And people will find this kind of strange that uh, parents to this sick child um, were open to have like this kind of weird looking dude come in and help them with their child but we need to understand that Alexei he was the only son of the Russian uh, Tsar's family the rest of them were girls and this made Alexei the heir to the Russian Empire so he, he if he died that was not good so of course they were overprotective of him and a side note is that the disease uh, Alexei was suffering from is called, as I understand it, hemophilia B. And that is also called the royal disease. And why it's called that is because it was very prominent in the royal families of Europe at the time. This came from Queen Victoria of England and through cousins and people being closely linked uh, the disease spread so that gives us kind of a more of an argument why you shouldn't you know intermarry with relatives and such things but hey fun afterwards I guess but anyhow Rasputin is now truly one of the close people to the SARS family especially because his healing abilities towards Alexei and it's been a kind of a great debate in modern times on what exactly Rasputin did to help the young boy in his suffering. And I mean, the rumors are extreme in some cases that some people talk about that he had like mystic abilities to help the boy. And a more scientific reason could be that in some way Rasputin knew how to administer what would be at the time like aspirin to the child that helped with the pain and eventually helped with the bleeding how he would have known this I have no clue and the people that I've read they, they don't really know either but that's one of the theories and others claim that he helped via hypnosis and that was a way to like ease the pain and if the patient then calmed down because of the hypnosis the blood flow would like subside how true that is i have no clue i've never witnessed anything about hypnosis more than i've like seen on tv but you know and and several times during 
his time as this trusted man around the family and children, he eased the pain for the young Alexei. And this made the parents cling on to him even more over time. And a special occasion was in 1912, where Alexei, he developed a very severe hemorrhage in his thigh during a, a carriage ride. And this was um, quickly turning out to be a, a big hematoma in, in, in his thigh. And this made the boy very ill. He was in a lot of pain and he quickly developed a fever. And the doctors at, its, at the scene, they thought that this was it. And the Serena Alexandra, she quickly sent a telegram for Rasputin because Rasputin at the time in 1912, he was uh, in Siberia. So she sends him a telegram where she asks if there's anything he can help, uh, help the boy with. Um, and she explains that the doctors doesn't know what to do. And Rasputin replies that she should not grieve and that the boy he would live because he knew this apparently and his demand was that the doctors needed to leave the boy alone and that Rasputin would pray for him and this would heal him in some way once again the kid is in St. Petersburg Rasputin is in Siberia but you know uh, two days later the bleeding actually stops and the boy makes what can only be described as a miraculous like recovery and one of the doctors uh, at the time dr sp fedorov he wrote down in his uh, journal and that the boy's recovery was he could not explain it from a medical point of view that the boy actually made it so he didn't know and according to more of dr sp fedorov's um, uh, notes he had witnessed rasputin before how he would like help alexei but also other patients that rasputin would walk up to a patient lay out his hands and start praying for them and spit where the person had pain or bleeding or something and that would shortly stop after he had done this and in the doctor's eyes he he could understand why the family could trust a man that could do this especially with with help and with uh, young alexi so how he actually helped him we don't know some modern speculations is that when Rasputin commanded to the doctors to leave the boy alone that that helped in some way with his recovery that um, like if they left him alone they they would not go in there and like turn the boy over and such like that so he was just laying in there and that for some way like made the hemorrhage go away for me uh, being not a medical professional and quite quite dumb I have no clue what the hell happened here I just chalk it up to lucky circumstances but, or anything I don't know but hey the boy lived and another thing uh, during all this time is that the family especially the Tsar and the Serena they teach their children to view Rasputin as their friend, essentially making him a part of, of the family. Like, you know, the funny uncle that looks weird, but he's always there at Christmas. And to say that this was without controversy is an understatement. I mean, just for the fact that this is a peasant from Siberia and suddenly he's rubbing shoulders with the royal family and rumblings among people close to the family and especially these children had their suspicions against Rasputin. Um, and of course, this was from people that also wanted his position, of course, as 
he was a close member to the ruling family. And, you know, if you're close, you have more political leverage than others and things like that. So in 1910, one of the girl's governesses, and a governess is, is kind of a kind of a tutor, babysitter for the children to help them um, educate themselves in like questions of etiquette and the royal life. And she's named uh, Sofia Ivonova Tuchera. I think I butchered that, but I'm sorry. Uh, she reported directly to the Tsar that she had been horrified that Rasputin had free access to the children's nurseries, especially the young girls. And when Rasputin visited them, the girls only had their ninth gown sewn. And this was kind of, you know, kind of on the nose. So she took her complaints, as I said, to the Tsar. And the Tsar asked Rasputin to end the visits to the nurseries, and which Rasputin did. But the request, though, did not sit well with the Tsarina Alexandra, who actually had the governess uh, fired shortly after this. And so that's like the next big rumor is that we see Rasputin's grip on the family, and especially Alexandra. And the rumors in the royal court was that she had started being involved with him. And even other um, royal ladies uh, was rumored that they were kind of sleeping with him. And... Um, about four other duchesses were accused of having like sexual relations with Rasputin and um, this made like cartoons and mockery uh, freely flowing in St. Petersburg, Petersburg and um, this actually got so bad that Tsar uh, Nikolai he actually begged Rasputin to leave the city for a while and he did this and went to a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and according to uh, witnesses at the time the Serena Alexandra was extremely upset by Rasputin's absence during uh, this time because I think he was like gone for a year so she was kind of pissed about it so and to like put on even more was that um, one other uh, of these uh, governesses she actually reported to uh, the Serena that she had been um, sexually uh, assaulted by Rasputin and um, when she reported this Alexandra claimed to her that Everything Rasputin did was holy. So it was just like, shut up. Shut up. He made you a favor, basically. And um, yeah, so you can see why all these rumors circulate about him. Um, so controversy aside, his abilities and his influence makes Rasputin very respectable and powerful in St. Petersburg and the circles where he frequents. So the royal family officially actually made him a so-called Lampadnik, and that means a lamplighter, whose responsibilities was to light the candles um, in front of religious icons in the palace. This was a two thing, because this was an extremely high honor and um, this also gave him access to the entire palace. Like there were no places that were not religious symbols and he could go anywhere. No one could stop him. So, and here we go into a little bit more of his followers because even though he spends a lot of time with the royal family, he's still preaching, he's still seeing people. He has his own apartment in St. Petersburg where he meets his followers. and. He preached during this time that physical contact between him and other people 
meant that he purified them. So, not surprising, he had many meetings, especially with women who wanted this so-called purification. And many of these meetings were, um, they were alone. So, yeah, take that how you want it. I always kind of laugh a little bit when it comes to like statements of that, when it comes from like cults or people proclaiming themselves being holy and, and things like that, that if you give yourself to them physically, like it will make you a better person, you will reach the next level or something. And I always find myself thinking like if I ever were to being like a cult and the leader goes like, yeah, I'm going to need to sleep with your wife <laughs> to make her go to the next level. That's going to be my like, yeah, this is not for me. But he um, was also accused of being a heretic and faced uh, criticism from even the prime minister of Russia at the time and the clergy. But every time they started a prosecution, the Tsar would intervene and stop this often on the Serena's request. So we now gonna enter a little bit of a turbulent time because even though Rasputin has the time of his life in St. Petersburg, the rest of Russia and Europe are embroiled in the First World War or the Great War. And things in the war was not going so well for Russia and uh, the Eastern Front was not doing good. The economic strain on the country because of the war was just like tanking the economy. And um, the people and many of the political enemies of the royal family, they blamed the Tsar and uh, the aristocrats and Rasputin for the decline of the country. So the idea to kill the mad monk started taking form and this was quite an undertaking because Rasputin actually survived an assassination attempt in 1914 when a peasant woman uh, called Kiwana Guseva stabbed him in the stomach outside of his childhood home and I don't need to tell you that uh, getting stabbed in the stomach in 1914 it's not a good odds but somehow after some time in the hospital he just survived and many doctors didn't think he was gonna make it but he did so this of course raised more rumors that he had supernatural abilities so people wanted to kill him but they were not really sure if they could do it but a group of nobles, led by the far-right politic, uh, politician Vladimir Purkevsky, or Purkevich, with the help of Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich and Prince Felix Yusupov, they felt that they could have a plan that would work. So, the reason they gave for killing him was that just because of the influence he held of the royal family and especially Alexandra and this was not good because that made the Tsar less of a leader so he needed to go so the plan was to lure Rasputin to Yusupov's palace called the Moika Palace in St. Peters Petersburg and here I'm just gonna go out and say that exactly what happened on the 17th of Sep December 1916 will most likely never be known but in especially Yusupov's memoir and reports from the town at the time we can gather enough information to give a picture of what happened so in the early morning of the 17th of December 1916, Rasputin arrived to Yusupov's resident shortly after midnight. And he was led down into the basement where food and drink was served. And not known to Rasputin was that the tea and many of the cakes served was laced with cyanide. 
And he actually kind of refused the cakes at first because, as I understand, he didn't really eat cake. But he later relented and ate several. And he even asked for wine that was also po- poisoned. And according to Yusupov, he at least drank three full cups of wine. But he seemed completely unaffected by the poison. And this might add, this is cyanide. So, yeah. This made Yusupov very worried. Because he's alone with him in the basement. So, he excuses himself at around 2.30. And goes upstairs. Where his fellow uh, conspirators uh, are gathered. And after consulting with them. He takes a revolver from Pavlovich and goes back downstairs, where Rasputin actually has continued drinking and eating. And even now, he Rasputin like shows no signs of being affected by the poison. So Yusupov basically goes and tells Rasputin to look at the crucifix in the room and say a prayer. And Rasputin just looks at him. And Yusupov just shoots him right in the chest. And Rasputin now fell, uh, falls to the floor. And um, the conspirators, they now drive to Rasputin's house. And one of them disguises themselves in his coat and his hat to make it seem like he has returned home. Why they did this, I don't know. Because later on they will... like kind of dumped the body so I don't know why they did this but they did it and after this they go they go back to Yusupov's uh, palace and goes down to the basement to take care of the body and when it comes down Rasputin suddenly leaps up from the floor and attacks Yusupov and after fighting him and fleeing upstairs Rasputin follows him upstairs and ends up outside in the courtyard and in the courtyard he is again shot but now it's Purskevich that shoots him he shoots him one time in the chest and goes right up to him and shoots him once in the head from very close range like in the middle of the forehead basically and they wrap his body in cloth and drives to a bridge and drops his body down into the Little Nevka River. His body is later discovered on the 1st of January 1917 and was examined by a doctor who reported that they, he could not find any traces of poison in his body. And he was buried at a small church and the funeral was attended by the royal family and some intimate friends his wife children and like the potential mistresses they were not invited but when the news broke that he was dead all four of the duchesses that were rumored to be sleeping with him they sat together on a couch being extremely down so yeah i don't know the plan by the royal family was to build a grand church over his grave to honor his memory this though would never see the light of day because in 1917 in October something happens in Russia it's the communist revolution and the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne and he and his family are killed by or murdered by the revolutionaries so Because of this, Rasputin's body was actually exhumed and burned by the new, the communists, basically. So his grave would not become a rallying point for loyalists um, craving like the old order. And his death took on a myth on its own. And at the first time I heard about this man, uh, I heard about his assassination and... The rumor I heard was that his death was uh, more extreme uh, because uh, it became a little bit of an urban myth and the urban myth was that he ate the poison food and drank poison wine and tea 
and after that he of course was shot but he survived immediately like he got shot in the chest and he like stumbles but he runs out and he runs out into the courtyard where he gets shot uh, one more time and then the conspirators they beat him with clubs to the point of, of like almost beating him to death and then he gets uh, castrated and getting shot in the head and just before they're gonna dump his body over uh, the bridge down into the river he speaks and he curses them and they in panic just dumps his body down in the water and when they find the body his cause of death is that he has water in his lungs meaning that his cause of death was from drowning and the hypothermia following the cold water and the reason for the castration was because one of his rape victims was present at the murder and wanted it removed and actually the rumor also was that he was very gifted in a nether, a nether region so yeah he had kind of a horse horse member on him and through the years a lot of rumors have been spread about him like that he was a magician um, that he had orgies with the entire royal family and um, this also relates to rumors that he made a deal with the devil when he was a young man like when he goes and have his religious experience that is actually uh, the time where he meets the devil and he gets supernatural powers and he couldn't really die so when his murder happened he simply transformed away to another body and still walks among us to this very day so that is the story of Grigor Rasputin and I mean what a dude <laughs> make yourself a favor and look up a picture of this dude uh, I'm gonna I have put up, up one on Instagram for the episode and give that a look because it's to to look at this man and not see anything else than a crazy person it's hard uh, I mean just his eyes like are just evil for some reason that's the feeling I get but I love the story of of, um, of this guy especially the way he dies uh, and both stories are amazing but just imagine yourself knowing that you're gonna kill someone by poisoning and they are just sitting there eating the poison food and he's not dying and yeah and even knowing that the bullet to the head killed him um, small part of me wishes that you know the second version is true that he didn't die he just he he curses them before they throw him down in the river just makes the mystery greater so yeah next time you see a bearded dude looking crazy might be resputing walking among us again you know and that is today's episode as always i thank you for listening uh, leave a comment or like and uh, subscribe on spotify and all the socials um send me a message if you want um to you, you know say hi or tell me to go f myself i don't know uh, thanks to the sponsor, conjureclothing.com. Go check them out. And until next time, thank you and bye-bye.